Hey folks, welcome to part two of my constructivism video series. Uh, in this video, we are going to be discussing what Davis and Sumera describe as subject-centered constructivism. And this refers to constructivisms that are concerned with individuals constructing their own understandings. So in short, constructivism is about connecting new knowledge to pre-existing knowledge. And it can be broadly understood as a learning theory that equates learning with making meaning from experiences. Now, how is this actually done? Well, to understand this a little bit better, we are going to look at Jean Piaget's theory of constructivism. Now, some of you may recognize the name Piaget uh, because of his theory of cognitive development. And this is certainly how I knew about him when I came into this program because I did take psychology in undergraduate. Um, but today we are going to be talking about his learning theory of constructivism. So the educational origins of constructivism are often ascribed to Jean Piaget who was a Swiss psychologist with a background in biology, very important, and he worked in child development. His work on um, his theory of cognitive development, when combined with some of his epistemological views, is sometimes called genetic epistemology. We're not going to go into that today, but just be aware that this may come up as you are doing lit searches on his work. And today we are specifically talking about his theory of constructivism, which you will sometimes call radical constructivism. And so in radical constructivism, Piaget is arguing that learning should be compared to the growth of living organisms rather than using mechanical metaphors. Now, an interesting kind of side note for those of you who are interested in languages, uh, Piaget doesn't specifically use the word constructivism or constructivist in his works. He uses language like structure, construct, construction. And our, one of our readings this week by Davis and Samara um, mentions that what he means by construction isn't immediately obvious. And this is for a couple of reasons. One is that, as one would expect, a lot of his ideas shifted over the years. I think his career was around like 60 plus years. Um, and he wrote 88 books, so this is bound to happen over the course of someone's career. And the second reason has to do with the translation. So Piaget's work was initially in French. And like our earlier discussion on um, issues with English translating words related to knowledge, like connaissance et savoir, some words just don't translate well from French or any other language for that matter into everyday English. So the French word constellier, and I'm, I'm sorry to any francophones if I mispronounce that, that's not a French word I use often, um, but that is the original French word. But in English, this can mean construe or construct. And in translating Piaget's work, um, the word construct was used, but this has caused some problems. So in English, we have a variety of different meanings for the words um, structure, construct, construction. Uh, a very common one, as I mentioned earlier, is buildings and architecture. And we use these metaphors a lot in learning um, when we're describing teaching and learning. So we may talk about foundations. We're going to talk about scaffolding today. Um, building blocks is another metaphor you'll hear quite a bit. And the second meaning of the word construct is a biological understanding of structure um, construct and construction. For example, when we were talking about the structure of an organism or the structure of an ecosystem. And here, structures are always very much something that's in process or in progress, and they are neither deliberate nor are they accidental. And this sort of meaning is much more aligned with what Piaget meant. And yet in English, the meaning between these two different translations um, is quite substantial. So when Piaget's work was translated, something was lost in translation when we picked construct. Um, because this turns our attention to more deliberate, explicit, um, optimal, whereas the word construe may have turned our attention more towards the contingent, the tacit, the adequate. Um, to me, um, the word construe implies more of interpretation and meaning making, which I think would be much more aligned with what Piaget was trying to get at. And so this issue of translation, into English at least, it leads to a lot of misinterpretations of Piaget's work. So what are we actually talking about when we talk about Piaget's constructivism or radical constructivism? So when we talk about Piaget's constructivism, we're really talking about radical constructivism, um, for those of you who want to look more into constructivism. Uh, in some places, it's also called Piagetian constructivism. And Piaget thought that learning should be compared to the growth of living organisms rather than mechanical metaphors of learning, like we talked about in individual learning. And here, learning is really about personal sense-making, as each person construes their world in their own way. So in constructivism, how do people learn? Well, learners reorganize their mental representations of the world, also known as schema, um, within this understanding of constructivism, and they do this to adapt to their circumstances. 
So when a new experience aligns well with an existing schema they already have, it is assimilated into their schema. But when it doesn't fit an existing schema, the schema has to be changed, and this is called accommodation. And within this, PJ argued that it is important to consider a learner's history of experiences because the sense that they make about an event or new information is very contingent on their own personal history. And this reorganization of their web of beliefs or their schema is always a subjective construal based on their biological and experiential history. And this is something you may have noticed in your group discussions um, this semester. So everyone in your group can read the same reading, but the sense that you're going to make from it is going to be different depending on your own experiential history. Now you may be wondering, okay, Rachel, people can't just construct the world however they like. And you're right. Um, this doesn't mean that we can interpret the world however we please. For example, there are physical constraints that exist within the external world. So I can't suddenly walk through walls or fly because in the world I've construed in my mind, I can do this. And as Angus McMurdry points out in one of our readings, if I were to test this belief of whether or not I could fly, what I have constructed in my mind about my relationship with the physical world will not be very viable for long. And this comes back to that idea of also having external coherence. So this is really about constructing a reality that is going to fit with our context. So then within all of this, what is knowledge? Well, as we've discussed here in constructivism, an individual's knowing is therefore going to be a subjective construal of meaning. And that means that this is about creating meaning rather than acquiring it. So here, learning and knowing is a matter of what's going to fit within the individual's current physical and social experiences. So here, learning and knowing is a matter of what fits with the individual's current physical and social experiences. It's not about correspondence with some kind of objective external truth. So it is a coherence theory of learning. And in constructivism, we acknowledge that the tapestry of our perceptions may be woven from entirely different experiences. So having identical interpretations isn't what's important here. Rather, it's are these different perspectives compatible. Now, how do we actually apply this theory to teaching? Well, a real challenge with constructivism is that is it is a theory of individual learning. It is not a theory of teaching, which is a trend you're going to notice with a lot of the things we discussed this semester. Uh, so constructivism is more concerned with how people make sense of the world. It's not as concerned with schooling or teaching. So as teachers, it isn't super prescriptive about what we should be doing, which I'm sure is exactly what you want to hear from someone in a course on applying learning theories to teaching. Um, but so rather than being a list of best practices, it's about, I think, more so reframing how we're conceptualizing learning, knowing, and our learners. And then this in turn will influence our teaching practice. And in the next few slides, I'm going to share some ideas that I came up with based on the literature, as well as my own experiences with teaching and learning. So my first thought on how to apply this learning theory is thinking of it as reframing how we see our role as educators. So here as educators, we are facilitators rather than being someone who transmits knowledge to learners. So in other words, our learners' minds aren't seen as being empty vessels that we need to be pouring this knowledge into. And teaching isn't about information transfer as we discussed in cognitivism. And it's also important to note that explaining and teaching aren't synonymous here. So part of our job here as facilitators is creating activities and assignments that engage our learners and help them explore concepts, guiding them through, for example, asking open-ended questions. Uh, we can also help them stay focused on their task at hand in the classroom and guide them in reflecting on their learning and making meanings from their experiences in the class. And here we can also encourage them in their critical thinking. As facilitators, we should also allow for the pursuit of interests and questions that arise in our classroom. And we want to bring in real life examples where we can and present multiple perspectives and allow our learners to bring in their different perspectives too. My second suggestion is coming up with activities that will promote active learning in your classrooms. Uh, so one thing you can do is go beyond workbooks and try to do some hands-on activities. Make your class interactive. Um, you may want to bring in some primary sources, for example. In math, you can also use manipulatives. Um, so physical objects we can use as teaching tools when we're teaching in a more hands-on way. Uh, for example, you could use color tiles, counting chips, um, base 10 blocks, um, play money, things like that. So an example from my own teaching where I've tried to make things more hands-on is teaching hand washing. So I have taught that to adults in the workplace. I have taught nursing students how to wash their hands properly. I have taught young children how to wash their hands. Um, so when I was actually teaching in an elementary school, a big portion of the teaching I was doing was how to wash their hands. So one of the things I used here was I used that lotion that glows under black light. Um, I think it's called glow germ or something like that. 
And I taught the kids how to wash their hands and then put the glow germ on their hands and showed them it with the black light so they could see that it was indeed glowing on their hands. Got them to wash their hands and then showed them what their hands looked like after they washed their hands. And then they were able to see how well they did it and if there was any areas that they missed. And I also used to use this exact same activity when I taught um, hand washing in first year nursing skills lab. Um, another example you could do to make things more hands-on is doing research projects and experiments with your learners. Um, example of this from my own experience as a learner in elementary school was in science. Um, I think it was grade six, probably grade five, grade six. Um, we had to devise a way to make an egg survive being dropped on um, one story. So instead of our teacher just telling us what to do or the underlying science, we were put in pairs, given access to a ton of different supplies, and told to come up with some sort of contraption that we thought would make the egg survive being tossed off of a one-story roof. And then we went outside and our teacher dropped them from the roof with an egg in it. And then we investigated, we looked at which ones cracked, which ones didn't crack. And we had a discussion about this and why we thought this occurred. And our teacher guided us through this discussion and connected the experiment to new areas of learning that we were going to be covering in our science class. And some other activities um, and assignment ideas you may want to consider include journaling and reflective writing. This is a really great way to guide your learners in making connections to their pre-existing knowledge as is using concept maps or mind maps. These activities all focus more so on ideas and connections between these different ideas rather than just having learners memorize things. And I often use mind maps in my own teaching, whether it is in-person teaching or online. And here I've listed a few examples of teaching strategies. These, this is by no means exhaustive. These are just some things for you to think about. Um, so problem-based learning or PBL is a great example here. Um, PBL is very much a learner-centric teaching strategy that focuses on real-world problems, so it's a nice fit here. Um, and this works by in groups of usually around eight, I believe. Um, learners work through a real-world problem. So for example, in medical education, where PBL is very, very popular, um, this would be a clinical scenario. And together they develop a viable solution. And here students have to build off of their prior knowledge and connect it to new experiences. And during this process, the educator is acting as a facilitator to guide the discussion. Some other teaching strategies you may want to consider include reflective practice, role play, and simulation. Although I will say with simulation, you want to be sure you're designing it in such a way that's informed by constructivism for it to fit within constructivism. Um, so you want to be doing it in such a way that you're making connections to their previous knowledge and focusing really on the learning process rather than a more behaviorist approach would just be are they demonstrating the behaviors that you're looking for on, say, a checklist? And with regards to assessment, we would want to consider here that we are dealing with a coherence theory of learning rather than a correspondence theories. So this is going to have major implications for the types of assessments we want to use. And so within this mindset, we want to be considering how we can support learner agency, how we can support their engagement, um, metacognition. And one of the ways we can do this is through authentic assessment. So authentic assessment tries to reduce the distance between the real world and the goal here is to make students think, learn, and perform in a manner that's similar to the real world. And this approach is very, very important to vocational and professional education, uh, such as nursing, um, medical residency, um, I'd even say Bachelor of Education program is where we are teaching teacher candidates. Something we also want to consider within constructivism is that assessment is ongoing. So instead of just assessing our learners at the end of an educational unit, also known as a summative assessment, like um, a final exam, uh, we want to evaluate them throughout their learning process. And this is called formative assessment. And so this type of assessment is far more informal, it's ongoing, it's more focused on our learners' um, improvement and their growth. Formative assessment isn't typically associated with grades, but it can be. When it is associated with grades, it is usually far more low stakes. Uh, something else we can also do is we can do some pre-testing or pre-assessment here to get a sense of what our learners already know and what kind of um, experience and knowing they're going to be bringing into our next educational unit or topic. And we also want to consider with all these different um, approaches to assessment that the process of learning is important to constructivism. So we can still use tests, for example, but we want to consider other kinds of assessment strategies that capture that learning process. Portfolios are a really great way to do this. Um, you can also do observations in your classroom, for example, observing communication and engagement if they are doing a, some group work or a group activity. Um, and if reflection as well is another great um, assessment strategy we may want to use. And we could also include um, self-reflection here as well. And I'm going to leave our discussion on constructivism here on assessment. 
And in part three, we are going to talk specifically about social constructivism. And I hope to see you all in part three. Bye.